question, right? Because I want to actually finish thinking about you. And the question that I have is what would you do if you had an extra 30 minutes per day? 30 minutes, and you can decide what you want to do with it, right? Because the thing I'm finding is we are so busy. How many of you agree that you're busier now than you were five years ago? Right? That's what I'm finding everywhere. Everybody, everybody's flat out. So what I want you to do, I want you to think about that, but before you do anything with it, I want you to take a look at the person sitting on the left of you. Just take a look. Look them over from head to toe. Take a look at the person on the right side of you. Same thing. I want you to pick the good-looking one for this next deck, sorry, sorry. I want you to pick both of the good looking people on either side of you, and I want you to share with them, what would you do if you had an extra 30 minutes of time per day? Go ahead. Again, if people are looking at you, you're really good looking. An extra 30 minutes. All right, let me reel you back in if I could. The reason why I ask that question, what I find is we are so busy today that most of us go through many days on mental autopilot. Who's ever done that before? You go through the day and you don't realize doing some of the things you normally do. And I think life's a little bit too short. In fact, when I ask people, what would you do with 30 extra minutes today? They normally fall into one of three categories. The first category is about my family or my kids. You know, I would go to my year five daughter's um, Friday afternoon assembly where she walks up to the front of the classroom and she gets the award, right? I'd actually spend some time with the kids. Or, what are those people? You, you, you were thinking about family? Okay, great. The other group is a little bit of me time, right? Maybe go for a run. Maybe, like, try to catch Samantha, right? Or do some swimming or something for you, maybe a massage, maybe a bit of a book. Where are those people? Okay, great. And then the third category are the workaholics who's sitting next to one of them. They were thinking about, what could I do at work? Yeah, they're pointing, they're dobbing you in, right? So they're thinking about, what could I do to get more things done at work? And I guess that's what I want to talk to you about today. I spent a little bit of time researching taking a look at what do people do at work to get more things done so they do have more time at home and for themselves. And I wrote the book called Leadership Hacks. And if you think of the word hack, a hack normally came from computer hackers kind of hacking into systems. Initially, it was negative. And then over time, the word has turned into, if somebody's a hacker, they're finding ways to do things faster. In fact, Facebook still run to this day a hacking competition to break their systems and find faster ways to do things. From a leadership perspective, a leadership hack is anything that can help you get more things done in less time. It might be a fast track process. It might be something that somebody uses, and the thing that I find quite often, somebody else doesn't even know how they're doing it, and they might even work together in the same organization or the same department. So what I'd like to do is share with you a little bit of some strategies around how you can get some things done faster. Now, I don't have time to go through all 15 of the hacks in the book, right? But I'm gonna share one. One that I find is one of the most powerful hacks you can use, especially if you're a manager of people and you need to mobilize and connect with them. But before I go into that, I wanna take a look at where did you learn to become a leader? Right? Because I think leadership, and if we're looking at the future of leadership, quite often, if you think about where do people learn to become leaders, a lot of people, it's from study. You might have read a book, you might have gone to uni, you might have gone to TAFE, you might have attended a course, and that's all the theory, and the theory is great. But what I find is most people lead to learn when they enter the workforce. Right? Because there's a lot of theories about bosses and managers and leaders, but when you start with your first job, then you actually start learning how to lead. I want you to think back to your very first job, the first job you ever had, where you got paid and taxes were taken out. Right? So mowing the neighbor's lawn doesn't count, babysitting doesn't count, 
And if you're sitting next to somebody dodgy, anything illegal doesn't count, right? Because the taxes weren't taken out. I want you to turn back to that really good looking person on both sides of you. And I want you to share with them what was your first real job. And the second question is, did you love it or did you hate it? Go ahead. Just turn back to them. Find out what was their first real job. First job you ever had where you entered the workforce. All right, let me reel you back in if I could. So um, again, it's a big auditorium. We have almost 500 people in the room. Um, what was your first real job? Just shout it out. What's that? Retail. Somebody else. Fast food. I've had a bit of that. What else? Hospitality. Somebody from this side of the room. First real job. Basketball referee. Whoa. Good, good. Here's my next question. Raise your hand if you loved your first real job. It was the bomb. Right? Can you raise your hand if you hated your first real job? You could not wait to start your second job, right? It usually goes into one or two categories. Um, my first job was on a farm, right? And as, um, as was mentioned earlier, I grew up in Michigan. Michigan is in the shape of the mitten. It's surrounded by the Great Lakes on the border of America and Canada. Um, that's why my accent's a little bit more Canadian than American. My parents lived 180 miles from the Canadian border. Drinking agent in Canada, 18. Drinking agent in America. 21, right? So I spent a lot of time driving there. But Michigan <laughs> is known for a couple of things. Michigan is known for lots of snow on the ground in the winter. So there's snow on the ground about five months of the year. An overnight dump of snow was one meter overnight, all right? The second thing Michigan is known for is Detroit. Who's heard of Detroit? Yeah, Detroit known for two things, well, really three things. One, cars. Right? Ford, General Motors, Chrysler, two, Motown or disco music, and three, guns and crime. But we're not going to talk about that. The other thing that Michigan is known for is farmland. Right? So around Michigan, there's plenty of manufacturing plants, and surrounding all of the plants are farms. And the growing cycle is a very, very tight growing cycle because you only have about 90 or 120 days to grow the crop to harvest it before the frost sits in. And I remember I was 13. Now, back then, when you were 13 and you wanted some spending money because I wanted to buy a new bike, what did my parents do? Yeah, they said, get a job, right? A little bit different than the younger generation. I loved Ash's presentation to talk about the different value sets and things like that. But my parents said, all right, it's leading into summer. What are you going to do? I said, well, maybe I'll get a job, right? And I remember we're driving down the road. And my dad said, all right, getting a job doing what? And I said, oh, I don't know. And I looked out the window, and there was a farm. And I said, well, maybe I'll just get a job on the farm, right? Like, it's, you know, it's close by, everything else. And my dad happened to spot the farmer on the tractor. <laughs> yep, he did it. He pulls over and says, all right, go ask for a job. Right? There was no online submission of CVs. <laughs> there was no talk to somebody, and they'll give you the job. I was 13 years old. You think I am vertically challenged now. Imagine what I was like back then. I walked out to the farmer. He's still on the tractor. Wild guy. I'll talk about him in a minute. And I said, um, excuse me, can I, can I have a job? And I'll never forget. He just kind of looked over me like, who are you, you little punk? Right? And I said, I, I work really hard. Right? I'm a, I'm a good hard worker. And he, he said, all right. Well, I'll give, you, I'll give you a chance. He'll give you a chance. I want you to start Monday. Right? And the on-farm, if anybody in here has ever worked on a farm or knows somebody that has, lots of hard work, you start at 6 a.m. I said, okay, great, so I'll meet you back here. And he said, oh, no, 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 this isn't my farm. I just happen to be spraying this for a friend of mine. My farm is on the other side of town. In fact, it's 10 miles outside of town. I'll see you at 6 a.m. And he drove away. Now, I came from a generation where if you got a job and you started at 6 a.m. and it was 10, side, 10 miles on the other side of the town, did mom and dad get up on Monday morning to drive me? No. Right? So what did I do? I jumped on my bike wearing jeans, 
10 miles one way, you should see my calves. They are calves of steel, right? But the interesting thing, I started working on it. And one of the things that I found when I had my first job, and you would have too, that's when you saw what do leaders do? What do employees do? What are the systems? How do you do things? And I'll never forget, I was about a month into the job, didn't know if the farmer liked me. Now, his name was Farmer Cricky, right? And Farmer Cricky had this bright orange-red hair. He had this wild scowl on his face. He was tall, sinewy. And the farm was called a muck farm. Can you say that word for me? Muck. Just say it one more time. Muck. It's just a great word, right? A muck farm is black, rich soil. Right? So we had to irrigate it all of the time. We had capsicum, we had celery, we had onions, and we were constantly irrigating. And it was about a month into it, and I remember talking to him, and he was on the tractor, and he said, well, once you finish with the irrigation, right? Because as you see these rows, what you had to do is you had to pick up the irrigation pipes, walk over the rows, put the pipes back down, hook them up to the pump to actually spray the water on them. So my bum was wet all summer. And he said, here's what I need you to do. When you finish laying that pipe, I need you to jump into the pickup truck and drive it back to the barn. Right? This is the pickup truck, 1979 Chevy. Right? Now, he started driving away on his tractor. What was I thinking as a 13-year-old? Yes! <laughs> Got to be honest, I was excited. Right? Because I'm going, I get to drive. Right? It's a little bit different now that people don't get their driver's license until they're 20, but we won't talk about that. Right? Back then, at 13, you get a chance to drive again. It's in the country a little bit. Let's do it. And it was interesting because I quickly got the irrigation pipe. I'm walking back to the pickup truck, and I slowly realized something. I didn't know how to drive. Now, I'd been on golf carts before, and I remember jumping on Dad's lap and doing like that, but I said, it can't be that hard. I jumped into the pickup, the ute, slammed the door, turned the key in the ignition. Nothing. Tried it again. Nothing. And then I started realizing maybe I don't really know what I'm doing. Right? I kept trying and kept trying. Here is the challenge. It was a manual on the column. Who's heard of a manual on the column? Right, because I had grown up in an automatic car, right, where you've, you know, it's an automatic on the steering wheel. Most, auto, you know, most manuals are a gear lever. The gear lever was actually on the steering wheel that you had to put into an H pattern. While you put it in the H pattern, you had to reach down and push in the what? Clutch. Who noticed that I am vertically challenged? <laughs> I, cu I couldn't even see over the dash. How far did I go in the next 50 minutes? Come on, I went six inches. <laughs> when I figured out that there's an emergency brake, and when I pulled it, the pickup just kind of settled in the mud a little bit more. <laughs> I looked up in the rear view mirror, and who was pulling up? Farmer Cricky. Right? It wasn't his hair bright red orange anymore, it was his face. He was furious. He was pissed off. Right? And I'll never forget to this day, I got out of it, and I was, sha I was physically shaking. I was crying. Right? And he came up to me, and I thought he was going to rip my head off. No lie. But he looked at me. He saw this 13-year-old sobbing. I said, I'm sorry. I just don't know what to do. I just, I just don't know how to drive. I'm only 13. Don't fire me. And in that instant, he looked at me. And when I thought he was going to fire me, he said, well, why don't you tell me? And I said, oh, I was just scared. I didn't want to let you down. See, I think this is what happens at work. I think too often we don't take the time to ask for what we need or communicate what we need or know or share what our strengths or our weaknesses are. In that moment, I saw what true leadership was. Because rather than actually being angry, he said, well, let's fix that. He spent the rest of the day teaching me how to drive. By the next week, I was driving the forklifts and the tractors. We won't talk about going into the ditch. That happened a couple times. Right? But I think that's what we know can happen from a leadership perspective. We, it's not about the theory. It's about what we see. And what I want to spend some time on you, with you today is about delegation. The number one mistake that most leaders make is that they do not delegate. How many of you have ever done that before? You had something. You had a team. You knew you shouldn't have delegated, but you didn't. 
My question is, why didn't you? In fact, why don't leaders delegate? Because we all know that if there's a team, we can get more things done in less time. What I've found is there's three reasons. Three reasons. The first reason is, it's faster to do it myself. Who's had this thought before? Yet by the time I explained it, I could have just done it myself, which is actually true. But what's the problem with that? I'm not building the skills or the capability of my people. I'm not engaging my people. I'm not developing the next level of leaders for my organization. And a lot of leaders get stuck into, well, at least I'm doing it fast. To me, it's a bit of a myth. That's one reason. The second reason why people don't delegate is I just don't trust my people. Who knows of a boss that you know that they don't trust their people? If you're sitting next to them, don't raise your hand. It's a CLM, career limiting move. Right? And the reason why, when I ask, why don't you trust your people? Normally, what do people say? Well, I ask them to do things, but they just don't what? They just don't do it, or they just don't do it the way I want to do it, so I just do it myself. Right? And I just rely on a couple of people that I know I can trust. Right? Which, to me, in this day and age, you just can't afford not to trust all of the people that you lead. And the third reason... I honestly believe this is the biggest reason why, is most leaders do not know how to delegate. Harvard Business Review did a study a couple of years ago, and they found that 50% of organizations admitted that their leaders and managers did not know how to delegate. Right? Even worse yet, it was something like 85% of them didn't offer any skills, any development, any tools to allow them to know how to do it effectively. Now, how many of you have kids? That you know of? Yeah, I've got three, right? I've got a 13-year-old, he's Luca. I've got a 15-year-old, that's Bella. And I've got a 17-year-old, which is Jasmine. Now, when Jasmine hit high school, she came home one day, and this was her maths problem. How many of you look at that and want to just look away? That's me, right? But being a good dad, I said, all right, Jazz, I'll help you. And I remember taking the time. We were up to like 12.30 at night. I was, you know, reading the answers in the back of the geometry book, right? I went home, you know, I went to bed exhausted but proud until a couple weeks later when she got her marks back. <laughs> See, math has changed a little bit in 35 years since I've been in school, right? In fact, she got a D, not an E, thank goodness. She didn't fail, but she got a D, right? Because I just didn't know how to do it. Now, my wife says that was part of my strategy because for the last five years, guess what I haven't had to help with? <laughs> Maths. Don't tell my wife I said that, right? In fact, Jazzy just had her trials. She's in year 12 for HSC, and she did maths, and she said she did well. And I said, it wasn't from me, all right? But I think this is the other reason why a lot of leaders don't delegate. They just don't know how to. The biggest mistake that leaders make is they just tell somebody what to do. So what I want to do is I want to share with you one of the leadership hacks on delegation. How do you delegate in a way that actually connects with people, mobilizes them, and actually helps develop and transfer some of your skills and capabilities? Does that sound good? Good. So and if you want to write this down, feel free. There are four levels to delegation, and I'm going to actually talk through these. The top level of delegation is what I call level four. Level four is you just do it, and I'm going to check the results. Right, so I'm just going to give it to you. Can I get your name? Yeah. Ben. So Ben, can you be an employee for me? All right, great. So Ben, I need you to do this task. Right, great, clear? Going to get it done? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it doesn't matter what the task is, but you do it, right? You're one of my staff. Great. Right, so that's kind of the delegation. I give it to him. I explain a little bit what it is, and I think he's done. I walk away. And what do I think, especially if I'm a new manager? This delegation stuff's easy. Just tell them what to do. And then I go back. And I know you've been working for me for a year or two. What's your name again? Ben. Yeah, Ben. How did you go with it? Can you show me the results? And guess what? He hasn't done it. Who's ever had this happen before? You ask somebody to do something, they don't do it. And I said, mate, why didn't you do it? Ben, why didn't you do it? Just because. Just because. CLM, career limiting move. The usual excuse is I just didn't have enough time. Right? So what I've found is most people will give their staff two goes at delegation. I tried it once. 
let it go. I try it one more time. Now he does it, but when I look at what he gives me, it's crap. And I'm not going to risk my reputation on it. I have to redo it anyways. So what happens in our relationship from here on out? I stop delegating. In fact, I go from level four all the way to the bottom to what's called level one. Level one is, you know what? Don't worry about it. I'm not going to delegate it because I'm going to do it. Who's ever done that? Big mistake, because the pattern now has been set. And the question I always ask is, who's now managing who? I've got a staff member that I should be developing and growing, but I'm doing all of the work. No wonder so many managers and leaders are stressed out and overworked, because they just don't know how to go to the next level. Level two. Level two is let's map it together. So Ben, here's the, here's the task. And what I want to do, let's map it together. And the language is very specific if you want to capture it. Map it together, then you're going to do it, and we're going to have some check-ins along the way. So let me show you what that means. I might grab a sheet of paper, right, and say, all right, Ben, here's the task. Or it could be on a tablet. I'm not going to tell him all of the actions that he should take to do the task. I'm going to ask him. See, this is the mistake most managers make. They tell rather than ask and show. So I'll go, Ben, what are the activities you think you need to take to make this task get complete on time? And he shares one idea, shares another idea. I might share an idea, but I capture the ideas on paper or on a tablet. We get all of the actions captured so we can see them. This is the important bit. If we just talk about it, uh, you kind of have an idea of what we talked about, but most people don't remember it. When we capture it, people can see what we've agreed to. The other thing that you can do when you go to level two is ask of these actions, there's six, what do you think you should start with? Ben, what do you think you should do first? Which one? Great, nice and confident. He pointed right up there. Did everybody see that? Right. So he says that one, and on the same sheet of paper, I'm now going to capture the sequence. Right? I'm still going to ask, and I might even coach him. I'd say, well, you could do that one next, but if you do this one next, it's going to make it easier for the next one. But I'm mapping it on the sheet. And essentially, we get through not just the actions that he needs to take, but the order or the sequence that he needs to take it. What starts happening to the relationship? It starts shifting. The other thing that you do is you do a check-in. So, uh, Ben, this task has to be complete by the 1st of September. Right? So, is it right with you? Can you go ahead and action, you know, areas one and two, Let's have a check-in on the 20th of August. Let's meet together. I want you to show me what you've come up with. What does this allow you to do? It allows you to check in and make sure that they're, A, staying on track as far as time, but it also lets them know that you're going to be there to help support them along the way. And we might have another check-in, right, after step four. Very simple. And this is the thing that I've found. The leaders that actually can get more things done in less time don't make it complex. They use very, very simple processes that they can actually use and they can pass on. Level three is very similar to level two. It's a slight shift. So once you've worked at level two with somebody, so Ben and I have done this for a while, level three is, here, Ben, here's what I need you to do. You map it, one sheet of paper. Then you show me, because I might have an email from somebody or there might be something else that I forgot to share with you, and then you go ahead and do it and we're still going to have a check-in along the way. What happens when you get people from level two to level three? Suddenly, staff are stepping up more. They're feeling more empowered, and you're actually creating what we call a leadership pipeline. Rather than having to go outside the organization, which happens all the time, I'm actually developing the capabilities of my staff beneath me to think, to problem solve, to map their plan. And I'm using a coaching process to help them. Can you just thank Ben for, just, just give him a little bit of a clap. Ben. I've got something for you here. Come on up. Just a copy of the book. That's on chapter three, delegation. <laughs> right. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to think about your next delegation. Right? I want you to think about the thoughts in your head, the tasks on your plate. And my question to you is, what should you be delegating? Because I reckon if we got more leaders delegating, empowering their people, you would probably find a way to have another 15 to 30 minutes of time per day. So you could focus on the important things. Here's what I want you to remember. 
I talked about May on the farm as a 13-year-old. I believe most staff, most adults are still 13. Who would agree with that? Right? We're all kids at heart, and I reckon sometimes we just need to take the time to connect with them and use a process to make it easier for them and easier for us. Who would have known that I would be talking about Farmer Cricky 35 years later? But wow, did he make a difference to me. Hopefully I've given you a couple of ideas. Thank you for joining us at Future Leadership.